Many players love the sneaky archetype in RPGs, but mostly it's seen as selfish. Spectre provides a new way to play Thief in Guild Wars 2, which allows you to support others directly and indirectly. If you love playing Thief as a bursty assassin, then by all means enjoy those other builds and specializations. But if you don't always want to play the same role, this video will show you how to play Spectre as a supportive playstyle in all game modes. And you won't need to get multiple sets of gear because this can all be done with one versatile build with only slight changes in the traits and utilities. If you're looking for a thief build that can hard carry in endgame PvE content, or a world versus world support that can secure kills, or you want to play PvP but don't want to be leaving every single fight every 10 seconds because a thief has no sustain, then this is the build for you. This is the Ritualist Spectre. First, let's explain the basic mechanics of Spectre that will serve as a foundation for the rest of this guide. Spectres lose three of their maximum initiative and no longer have access to stolen abilities, but gain access to Shadow Shroud. Steel also becomes Siphon, which is a 1200 range attack that no longer moves you, but will give slow to enemies and grant you Shadow Force when targeting an enemy and give an ally barrier when targeting them. Shadow Shroud skills do not cost initiative, and you gain Shadow Shroud by using initiative in combat. Entering into Shadow Shroud gives barrier and tethers you to an ally. You can determine who gets tethered by targeting them. You can also retarget who is tethered by siphoning another ally. While tethered, landing your Shadow Shroud abilities will heal your tethered ally, so you want to play aggressively while you're in Shroud. Your Shroud serves as a second health bar anyways, so you're relatively safe to do so. While you are in Shroud, you gain initiative, so you generally want to use up all of your initiative before going into Shroud so that you don't cap on initiative and waste the excess. All skills in Shroud will heal your tethered ally when they land, but then there are other effects. The one skill in Shroud is a projectile that will give torment to enemies and might to you and your tethered ally. The two skill, Grasping Darkness, places a ranged ground target that after a short delay will give cripple and torment to enemies in the area and will cleanse a condition from you and the tether. This is also a blast finisher which can give stealth to yourself and allies when used in a smoke field which you'll have access to on the pistol 5. Giving stealth to allies will also grant them 2000 barrier and when you give barrier to another ally you give them a stack of rot wallow venom. When they hit a target, they will apply Torment using your stat modifiers, so by supporting your allies, you can also be contributing damage to the enemies they're targeting. The 3 skill is a Leap Finisher that fears enemies on impact and will give barrier to yourself and an amount of barrier depending on how many targets you hit. The 4 skill, Eternal Knight, is a short range double hit in front of you and will give poison and chill on the first strike, and then weakness and poison on the second, also healing yourself and the tether if it lands. The 5 skill prepares an attack that stuns nearby enemies after a few seconds, and will create a blast finisher, which will grant you stability and your tether stability if you are still in shroud when the attack finishes. The equipment I use is full ritualist stats, this is mainly a support build, but when supporting allies, you give Rotwallow Venom and therefore still do decent torment damage. That's why the expertise and condition damage are good. Despite being a support though, healing power isn't necessary because much of your healing as a Spectre does not scale too well with healing power anyways, but the boon duration is great for giving more quickness, alacrity, and many other boons when stealing. The main stat of vitality on Ritualist gear is also extremely good for Spectres because your Shroud pool scales based on your health, and the more Shroud you have, the more you can support your allies with the Tether, so in a way vitality is more effective for healing than healing power is. I take Rune of Durability which you can get from the World vs World Provisioner because this will add even more health 
for your shroud scaling, and the extra toughness can be useful since you otherwise have none. The boon duration is also good, and the extra boons it shares to nearby allies when struck help you and them stay alive. You'll take a short bow with energy cleansing sigil, which can be used as a defensive weapon or for AoE, and then your main weapon set will always have a scepter in the main hand with the doom sigil, and you can swap between an offhand pistol with the celerity sigil, or an offhand dagger with a sigil of demons. In open world PvE and competitive game modes, the pistol offhand is much better because the dual attack can provide better support to single targets and it has potential for piercing damage when there are multiple enemies. The dagger offhand doesn't really work too well with the scepter and the three skill which you're going to be using most of the time is only single target, but the dual attack does provide better results for instanced PvE content which you absolutely can perform well in with this build as an alacrity source that does great damage as well and can even play the role of a kiter. For open world PvE, the traits I take are Deadly Arts and Trickery. Potent Poison increases the effectiveness of the other two Deadly Arts traits. Panic Strike will poison enemies you immobilize and immobilize enemies that you hit below the 50% health threshold. Deadly Ambition will give poison to enemies you hit with your dual attacks. Your three skill while dual wielding is a dual attack, and the Scepter Pistol 3 is both an immobilize and a dual attack, so it'll give four stacks of poison due to potent poison. Siphon will also inflict poison for a long duration, and you give weakness to enemies that you poison. In Trickery, I take all of the steel enhancing traits. You share Might, Fury, Swiftness, and Vigor to nearby allies when using Siphon. Bountiful Theft will also steal two boons from the Siphon target and grant those to nearby allies, meaning you can provide many boons to your allies just by using your Steel or Siphon. Sleight of Hand will daze the target which will trigger the Celerity Sigil to give you quickness. Inspector take Consume Shadows which will deplete all of your Shroud after you leave Shroud and will heal you and nearby allies for a percentage of your remaining Shroud based on how long you stayed in Shroud. Essentially, you gain stacks of Consume Shadows, which increases this percentage up to a maximum of 5 stacks. So you want to stay in Shroud for at least that long, use all of your Shroud skills in that time, then leave once you're out of skills to use. This will give you a lot of healing, but will also reduce the amount of Shroud you have, which isn't an issue since you get plenty of it in PvE anyways. However, it also gives this healing to nearby allies, which allows you to play a very strong supportive role in a team. Next, take Traversing Dusk, which will make all well utilities grant alacrity to yourself and allies in the radius when they're initially cast. Alacrity isn't amazing on Thief because initiative is not affected by it, but a lower cooldown on your siphon and other utilities can be decent. However, that isn't all this trait does. It also heals nearby allies in the area when you port and you'll gain Shadow Force every time you port, giving more Shadow Force the more allies you heal. Every well is a port, but also other skills like the Scepter Pistol 3 and the Shortbow 5, and even Shadow Step, which is two ports in one skill, can add up to a lot of Shadow Force generation. Finally, I take Strength of Shadows, which gives more condition duration and damage reduction against enemies with conditions on them. I take the Well of Gloom and the Well of Sorrow, which both add conditions to enemies inside them. Haste will give quickness and swiftness, which complement the boon up times from stealing with the celerity sigil. Spider Venom has no animation to it, which fits well in this high cast time build. And it gives the next six attacks poison to add extra burst, and it can also be shared to nearby allies. In group play, this is amazing damage, but in solo, it can also be shared to your elite skill, Thieves Guild. You want to start every fight with Spider Poison, wait for Thieves Guild if that's up, haste, and then you want to siphon to get your Celerity Sigil, and then you want to just spam 3. And your initiative will be pretty high at the start, so you can use your Pistol 5 as well to blind any enemies who get close. Once you have a decent amount of Shroud, 
or even a little amount, you can enter Shroud and use your 2 and 4 skill first because they do the most damage. If you're not in range to use the 4, then just leap in with the 3 and then you can use the 4. But watch out for the fear, you want to get the cripples first. And then you want to use the 5 and 2 before leaving Shroud and resume the normal priority of keeping your initiative from maxing, using your utility skills off cooldown, and going back into Shroud when you have nothing else left to use. You want to gather enemies together and hit them all with the piercing beam of the Scepter 3 to get the most value out of it. Headshot can also break defiance bars easily and trigger your celerity sigil if your siphon misses. In group PvE content where there's only one target to hit and you don't want to be porting all over the place, you take the dagger with the demon sigil instead of the pistol offhand. Twilight combo allows you to deplete your initiative much faster, so you can also fit in a rotation of wells to give your team more alacrity. And you can also, instead of sleight of hand, take the quick pockets trait because entering into shroud counts as a weapon swap and that'll give you more initiative when you go into shroud. Then take the well of bounty instead of haste for more alacrity and Basilisk Venom instead of Thieves Guild to provide heavy CC for break bars. The skill priority here is the same, but with the addition of needing to use Wells to give alacrity to your team. Always spam Twilight Combo to prevent yourself from maxing on initiative, Spider Venom off cooldown when in range of your team, then use all of your Wells if your party will be together to receive the alacrity, otherwise save the Wells until they can regroup, go in Shroud, use 2, 4, 5, 3, 2, and then pop out and resume spamming three and your wells. Until this point, you're pretty much okay with targeting only enemies in PvE, but when you get to competitive modes, you'll need to be able to target allies, because most other supports in Guild Wars 2 give their boons and healing simply through point blank AoEs and ground targeted abilities, they never really need to target allies. But Spectre must target allies frequently due to single targeted support. While this has its disadvantages such as you may not be able to heal separate people who need it at the same time, you can be line of sighted by your allies, or you may struggle to find the right target, the reward is that you can support infinitely due to how initiative works and you can get decently aggressive potential out of that support. There are a few options that you can enable to better improve your targeting as well. In the targeting section of Keybinds, you can toggle Ally Targeting mode, which allows you to only click on allies with your mouse, while you can still tab target enemies, so you can much more easily get the right target. There's also the Target Nearest Ally Keybind, which can help you to instantly target players who are in your immediate vicinity, so you can heal someone rather than trying to target someone who isn't even in the same fight as you. Also, there are personal target keybinds, which allow you to set target that you can later use the take personal target keybind to target later on. I usually like to set the person who needs the most support as my personal target, so I can be on them quickly with support, and it is convenient to not have to click on them every single time. At first, learning new keybinds will be tough, but once you get used to them and which situations they work in, like if you're in PvP, you may want ally targeting mode since there are so many potential allies you could support. Or if you're duo roaming, then having a personal target on your party member will go a long way. You'll see that Spectre support can be very powerful. Another option that all Spectres should take is the instant ground targeting with the allow skill retargeting. This allows you to change the end location of your wells mid cast so you can adapt to the situation and be more precise with your wells. In World vs World you can roam with a small scale party and provide support to individual players, or you can provide AoE healing in Zergs while sharing out Venoms and ripping stability from single targets to allow your team to pick them off. From this point on, competitive modes will be using the pistol offhand because the port gives so much more shroud generation, and the endless knight skill when targeting an ally will quickly pulse barrier, quickness, and regeneration to your target 
which is very powerful for putting on a heavy DPS class to supplement their damage with your Rot Wall of Venom and Quickness. Also, unlike other supports in World vs. World who struggle to get loot because they don't tag enemies while they're supporting, Spectres tag enemies with the torment they give out when supporting, so you can focus on doing your job without worrying about whether you want to be greedy for rewards. The Devourer Venom shares Immobilize, and Basilisk Venom shares a stun with Unblockable to your allies' next attacks. Take Mug and Improvisation in Deadly Arts. Improvisation doesn't give you a second stolen ability because there are none, but it can recharge Devourer Venom for more CC. Will of Bounty, which is just a low cooldown well, which gives regeneration, protection, and then resistance as the first few boons it pulses. Or even Shadow Step, which would give you more playmaking or survival potential. Also, it's two ports, which gives you a lot more shroud. Take Hungering Darkness for more condition cleanse and sustain to your tether. You want to find a target within your group that does great damage and can benefit from quickness or has multi-hitting attacks and then use your siphon on them. The game will prioritize your tether on previously siphoned allies, and you can also put a focus target on them if you want. In Big Zergs, using the closest ally target keybind is really good because you will generally get the best value that way. Constantly using ports from Wells and your Scepter 3 will get you massive amounts of shroud generation because of how many targets you can land on them in World vs. World, so you can consume shadows to give large heals by going in and out of shroud non-stop. Position and support your allies, then when you decide that you want to go for a kill on a specific target, you can share your venoms to allies and then siphon a target. Because you have mug, your siphon will also have a packet of damage on it, which will apply your venom to the target while also removing their stability because of bountiful theft, prioritizing the stability first. So they won't have stability, and they will either be stunned or immobilized, singling them out to be taken down by your team. This is extremely useful in those large group battles of attrition because picking off single players one by one gets you many advantages. If you're solo roaming or duo roaming, the venoms aren't as useful, so you can replace Basilisk Venom with Shadowfall and Devourer Venom with a second stun break like Signet of Infiltration, Roll for Initiative, or even Haste, and then take the Potent Poison Deadly Ambition package for more versatility to be able to target enemies with your dual attacks as well. Then replace the Consume Shadows trait with Shallow Grave for more selfish sustain, though if you're solo roaming, I feel the Power Spectre build is much better, so try to stick to at least one ally with this build. For PvP, go to the PvP Equipment panel and use the Carrion Amulet with the Ore Rune. Hungering Darkness is nerfed in PvP, but you still take it, so Ore Rune helps to make up for the loss in cleanses, while also giving you more health, which means more Shroud and Sustain. Sigil of Misery on the Scepter increases the duration of Torment, which is your main damage source, and Transference Sigil can add to your support capabilities. Even though you aren't going for healing power, healing modifiers still help. Energy Cleansing on the Bow. Replace Consume Shadows with Shallow Grave, because you don't get enough Shroud generation in the small scale PvP encounters to be depleting your Shroud every time. You'll get more healing by allowing the tether and landing skills in Shroud. Also, take Shadow Arts. Shadow Savior doubles up the healing from the Traversing Dust trait as well, and Cloaked in Shadow can peel for your allies by blinding enemies when you enter stealth. Your Scepter Sneak Attack is Shadow Squall, which heals for a lot. You can't actually see the tooltip on most monitors because of how large it is, but you can heal for like 6k. So whenever you heal or steal to an enemy because of the Shadow Arts traits, you'll be able to gain one second of stealth, but since that's all you need to be able to use your sneak attack, since it's ranged, that's enough. And this is also where your keybinds and settings come in. If you have to steal to an enemy, then retarget an ally within one second to land your heal on them, 
you need to be quick with the targeting. I also take Blinding Powder in PvP as a second stun break, but also as a powerful peeling tool for my allies. Stealth detargets your allies for enemies and gives them barrier. So even if they instantly reveal, it gives your team presence. There are also some combos you want to do with Shroud and your Pistol 5 to give out stealth periodically. So you can keep giving out barrier, blinds, and gain access to Shadow Squall, which can give much more instant support than channeling Scepter 3 nonstop. The hardest part about Spectre is rewiring your brain from being a kill securer to a kill preventer. Using your shadow step to get on top of your allies so you can blinding powder them and shadow squall is something you should be doing often, not saving your shadow step for stomps or chasing kills. Here's a Spectre 3v3 match. Even though I believe that Spectre is extremely good in 3v3s, you'd definitely be able to play it in Conquest. And since the current game mode is deathmatch in ranked because it's off season, this is a good time to show how good Spectre can be in these team fights. So we're going against a, I think this is probably the meta comp. It's like Willbender, Core Guardian, Harbinger. So we're playing with a Harbinger, a Core Warrior, and a Spectre. So we start out giving a lot of support to the Warrior because they're getting focused and the yeah the harbinger doesn't really need that much healing i have to retarget to my warrior here i can chase though with the ports land some decent barrier on them i stealth them and give them my shadow squall which heals them pretty much to full so we're doing pretty okay but i'm taking a lot of counter pressure as well so i go into shroud and just start counter pressuring i land a decent amount of cc on the enemy with my mind shock the Willbender is on me, but I'm still chasing with my Wells. Land another Shadow Squall, which is very timely with my heal skill. And then I Shadow Fall on the enemy team just to try to peel as hard as I can. Their Willbender is actually going into their Elite there because they're very pressured. And I'm just topping my team off. The Warrior is taking a lot of pressure again, so I use Blinding Powder to Shadow Squall. And I land another large amount of barrier on them, but... Even through my passive from Shallow Grave, they get bursted. So we're probably gonna, yeah, we're probably gonna lose. Well, they have one down too, but they don't get the revive and we actually, our warrior did vengeance. So this is sort of a 2v2 at this point because we're gonna lose the warrior. So I have to just worry about healing the Harbinger now. Uh, I'm a little bit low though, so I wanna try to play safe and keep myself alive as well. I know that my uh, Harbinger is probably running a pretty tanky build here, so they'll probably be fine. I'll probably be the focus target, so I'm just trying to survive. I stealth and go for a little bit more healing on my Harbinger, but I don't have to play too safely because they're doing fine. I land a good Shadow Fall, and their Guardian has no more stun breaks left, so they're going to be taken out. They do have their Elite, and that's pretty much not going to give them much else, though, because I'm still giving Torment to them through my... Harbinger just hitting them and I'm just trying to play safe, give them the Rotwall of Venom, give them the CCs and pretty much just run this down because there's pretty much no way that we can lose this 2v2. This is like a Harbinger and Core Guardian versus a Spectre and Harbinger, which I think we have the advantage in this matchup. So we're doing pretty well here because we've got a lot more throughput. And yeah, we get the Guardian down, I cleave, and now we're gonna be able to take this first victory. Here's round two. As usual, I will give my teammate stealth at the start, which is a very big advantage because then we get to choose who we wanna attack first and they can't really see what's going on. So the stealth is very valuable to the 3v3 meta, but he, yeah, the Harbinger is getting focused at the start, so I try to use some Wells maybe to get to them and heal them. But yeah, they're going to retarget probably to... Yeah, they're on me now, so I have to play safe. Go in Shroud here and counter pressure. Use Mind Shock and the Leap there to get some extra barrier. Now I'm looking for who they're focusing. I use my Shadowfall there just to get in range to like peel for my team. I use my siphon on their harbinger so they couldn't keep free casting and i go in stealth here to shadow squall my warrior 
they're doing fine now and my harbinger is taking focus so i give them some barrier and i go into shroud i'm getting a lot of cc on me and the harbinger is focusing me but this is fine because it's all damage being put into my shroud and i'm pretty healthy already so i shadow squall after using my heal skill because i got a little bit of stealth and just topping my team off give some barrier to my harbinger and i'm gonna get out of there because their will bender is doing a lot of damage in the area i don't want to take too much damage because yeah but our warrior is now taking a lot of pressure and i was kind of line of sighted there as well because of my positioning so that didn't work out too well another thing with uh, specter is yeah you do want to be very careful about your positioning and especially in these pvp fights where people are moving all over the place you can get line of sighted by just not facing the target that you're trying to heal so in those cases you kind of want to let go of your mouse and don't move your character and the game will automatically like use your uh, scepter 3 at the target even though they're moving all around you but yeah we've lost our harbinger is alive but we've lost our warrior so i don't think we can win this match at all so let's just go to the next one after losing another round we are pretty much going to lose if we lose another round so we need to really play very safely here i'm going to probably spam my cooldowns a lot faster so that they don't burst down one of my players before i'm able to react so i am trying to play a lot more preemptively on the support especially on my warrior but yeah if they do swap to my harbinger i got to be careful about that as well but usually they're probably going to focus the warrior because they're a little bit easier to to focus down i do get a really good mind shock there and they stun break but we're in a pretty good spot because we've just baited their cooldowns and they land a massive shadow fall on their entire team and they're all forced to leave but now we're in a really good spot because they probably lost a lot of their cooldowns though i have to be careful because my warrior can still get focused i have shadow squall ready but they're all full health so i don't really need to use it so i go in shroud instead and land some damage from my shroud abilities i put down the smoke field there and i blast it to get some barrier on my allies and now my warrior is really getting focused i give them barrier and i am trying to peel for them by using the days from the short before and now i'm using the scepter three to give them tons of barrier i'm going to probably yeah they're all really low so i'm going to probably just go in aggressively and yeah we get two downs from that and they can't really res through this because i've got so much cc and yeah we're gonna take this match so one more match as usual i give out stealth to my allies so we can get the preemptive and i get in combat by getting hit by one of the marks which is actually pretty good because i can start generating my shroud early and i can do so by just porting around i go into shroud early even though i don't have any shroud just to get the initial barrier there and then throw out all my abilities and then get out the warrior is really low so i have to let go of my mouse here and give them the full uh barrier there from the endless night it's very dangerous here i don't want to be too close because we're going to take a lot of cleave i do land my shadow fall but they have stability and my warrior is really low so we have to really be aggressive i give the barrier out and now i'm giving yeah i shadow step in there and use my blinding powder to shadow squall them and peel but now i've been playing so uh team oriented that my yeah my health is really low so now i'm going to be focused and they're coming in to get me i go in stealth with my heal skill and i port out with the sherpo 5 but i still need to heal my team so i have to risk my positioning a little bit i go in stealth with the steel and shadow squall actually i don't use the shadow squall because they're out of range but i do heal quite a bit here i can use my wells to give my team a little bit more healing i know that my harbinger is going to be fine just chasing their support so i'm just chasing my warrior to heal them i land a shadow squall but that reveals me so i'm in a little bit of a dangerous position but they're not focusing me so it's fine I can play more aggressively to heal my warrior and give out more of that cc my shadow fall is up so i can do that but my harbinger is really low i have to give them the support shadow fall goes down they have stability and stun breaks though and i'm going to follow up with some more fears 
My warrior is probably okay, but I'm going to give them more healing. And now I'm getting focused. I shadow step out just to keep myself alive. And now I go into stealth. No one really needs healing, so I can just safely go into Shroud here and play aggressively. Their Guardian has pretty much no cooldowns, so I land a decent amount of damage there with my team to finish that off. And I throw out all of my CC from the Poison as well to make sure that they can't get the revive there. And at this point, the only way that we lose is if they can get a burst kill on one of us. So I'm going to play as safely as possible to keep my Harbinger alive and we're going to secure this kill and then we can just 3v2 this until we win. So that is pretty much how you want to be playing the support specter in PvP. In Conquest, obviously you want to add rotations to that, but if you want to know how to play a support rotationally and the priorities for that, you can check out my how to support video. With that being said though, if you want to support me and like this content, then like the video, subscribe for more, and share the video with anyone else. Also, if you'd like to support me directly, please consider becoming a patron. I would greatly appreciate it, and it helps to fund the time and effort that I put into creating these guides. Thank you to those who do support me already, and for the rest of you, enjoy the video. I will see you all next time.